good evening and uh, welcome to the main One Book, One Community event, the screening of snow uh, and the panel discussion. I'm Don Burke, I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Public Health at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, and I'm pleased uh, to have you here to help celebrate our third annual One Book, One Community event. Uh, that uh, this uh, was kicked off this past fall by, with the book, The Ghost Map, uh, written by Stephen Johnson, which I think all of you have read and had a chance to discuss by now, uh, which tells the story of epidemiologist John Snow and his groundbreaking investigation of the London cholera outbreak of 1854. Snow's scientific approach to the outbreak uh, led him to become named the father of modern epidemiology. Tonight, our marquee event is the viewing of the film Snow, written and directed by Isaac Ergus, uh, which chronicles Snow's approach to the cholera outbreak. Isaac, you want to wave your hand here so people can see you? Uh, now, I found out that this is truly a small world. Uh, when I was talking to Isaac, and where's, where's Ted? Ted's in the back there, Ted Levant. Uh, um, in uh, 1996, uh, when I was working in the jungle in Cameroon uh, on a road which was not much wider than this podium, uh, uh, which was a dirt road in the middle of nowhere, uh, there were four Peace Corps volunteers um, who needed a ride to the next village. Uh, and as it turns out, uh, one of those Peace Corps volunteers uh, from uh, more than 15 years ago was Ted. Uh, he, had a, he jumped in the back, we gave him a ride, I gave him my card, uh, and uh, and he, he somehow remembered uh, this uh, relationship. But uh, uh, so this really, once just, uh, this really is a small world. Once you get into working with people that are in this business, uh, you develop uh, uh, relationships that reappear for life, I can assure you. Uh, uh, and similarly, uh, uh, Isaac was also in the Peace Corps in Cameroon, as it turned out, at the next village over. So we have the in common. Uh, working in a, in a part of the world. Uh, not only do we have a inter shared interest in the epidemiology of infectious disease and Jon Snow, uh, but we have this background uh, in common uh, in working uh, in remote parts of the world. So uh, we're excited and fortunate to be able uh, together uh, to put the book together with this film uh, and particularly grateful to Isaac uh, for coming to Pittsburgh to air the film for you. Uh, uh, and uh, now, uh, uh, do you want to do you want to say a word or two, or should we just go on to you? I guess we'll. Uh... Uh, sure. I mean, I would just uh, I guess I'll just say. Oh. Yeah, come on up, and I'll let you take the. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, just say thank you for coming and seeing this film, uh, and uh, thank you to uh, the School of Public Health here for uh, bringing me out and just being so gracious um, in, in in hosting me. Um, I, uh, I am the writer and director of this film, Snow. It's a short film. Uh, it's about 20 minutes um, about Dr. John Snow, who clearly you all have heard of. Um, and, and yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that. I think I'm just going to let it speak for itself. I think you'll enjoy it more that way. Um, this is uh, actually my uh, first time um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, coming to a, uh, a screening with a public health audience. Um, while it has screened in other public health related venues. Um, this has really been the first time I've gotten to, um, to be here with the film. So with that said, I'm, I'm actually just really uh, curious to hear how the movie hits you. And uh, afterwards, I'm just kind of looking forward to hearing um, your comments, both uh, good and bad, and uh, your questions. And I'll uh, do my best to answer them. Do so you, thanks again. Do you want people to make audible responses during the movie? Uh, <laughs> if you feel like giving me an audible cue <laughs> while you're watching, feel free. A cheers or a booze <laughs> or... Uh, I'd right. say whatever moves you. Okay, good. Uh, enjoy the film. Good, All right, thanks. And why he made it in a few minutes, but first I'm actually going to show you a little taste of another film. The trailer for a film that some of you may have seen already called The Shot Felt Round the World, which is Carl Kurlander's documentary about the development and testing of the Salk polio vaccine in Pittsburgh. Carl's going to be one of our panelists tonight, and he and Isaac and I thought that it would all be interesting for you 
to think about these two films together as very different examples of how public health stories can be presented in film. So I'm going to show the trailer for The Shot Felt Around the World real quick, and then I'll introduce all our panelists and we can see what kind of questions you guys have for them. So now let me finally, finally introduce tonight's panelists so we can talk to them. Um, I'm Eleanor Feingold, by the way. I'm the Associate Dean for Education at the School of Public Health. Uh, I'm going to make these introductions a little bit brief because I want to have lots of time for us to talk to these guys. Uh, our filmmaker, Isaac Gerges, you've already been introduced to. Um, Isaac has his feet solidly in both public health and filmmaking. His glamour job is actually as a SAS programmer for Kaiser in California. <laughs> Uh, but he also has an MFA in film and television production from USC and a growing career as a filmmaker. He's made several short films and won several awards so far, and he's hoping that his next project will be a feature-length film, uh, maybe about the Jon Snow story. You want to come on up? And I'll... This one. Uh, you've also had a little bit of an introduction already to Carl Kurlander. Carl's a screenwriter and producer who has devoted <coughs> the current phase of his career to developing film industry in Pittsburgh. He's a member of Pitt's Film Studies Program and the founder of the Steeltown Entertainment Project. We have another guest from our own Film Studies Program, Adam Lowenstein, and Adam's interests are in horror and trauma in film and the role of film in historical and cultural confrontation, and we thought it would be very interesting to think about those issues in terms of presenting public health and medical issues in film. And finally, we have two of our own GSBH faculty on the panel. Uh, Jeremy Martinson is an infectious disease expert and enough of a Jon Snow buff that I was able to talk him into being here tonight as the uh, resident scientific expert on the panel, since none of the rest of us are infectious disease people. And finally, Bernie Goldstein is um, an expert in environmental risk assessment and the former dean of the school. Uh, Bernie just last month published a paper that uses the Jon Snow story as more or less a parable to talk about the precautionary principle in public health. I'd like to start this off by getting Isaac to tell us a little bit more, whatever you feel like saying about how you made this film and why you made this film. I'm really interested in the question of sort of entertainment versus education, and I think a lot of people would be interested in hearing about that. Okay, cool. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, so yeah, so I, um, as Eleanor mentioned, I do work, uh, I have a day job at Kaiser Permanente, a very large HMO on the West Coast. Uh, as a SAS programmer, I, I got my MPH uh, at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, in epidemiology and biostatistics. Um, actually, I have to say, my, my public health career really starts uh, in the Peace Corps. Um, that's where I first got exposed to public health and um, worked in a lot of uh, water-related projects and things. Uh, and when I came home, I, I thought that I was going to do international development work um, as a career. So I went back, got my MPH, uh, got involved actually in local water uh, water. Uh, related research, and um, it was there that I also actually met my wife, and uh, we, uh, who was also in public health, and we actually uh, together kind of fell in love with the Bay Area and decided not to leave in the end. Uh, so I ended up uh, getting a local job and working uh, at uh, Kaiser's Division of Research, working on breast cancer studies, where I continue to work uh, today. Uh, throughout that entire time, I also have. Uh, just had interest in other things, as I'm sure everybody does, and uh, I got interested in acting and um, started auditioning and uh, getting some training at uh, the local acting, at, uh, the American Conservatory Theater, and I got tired of acting and, um, I'm sorry, I didn't get tired of acting, I got tired of auditioning. <laughs> <laughs> the acting part was great, it was the auditioning that was uh, very stressful, and uh, going through so much rejection. Um, can be uh, very trying. So I decided I was going to start making my own movies and putting myself in my movies. And then whoever wanted to watch them could watch them. And uh, so I started doing that for a while and realized that I was a really uh, crappy filmmaker. And uh, I should probably get some training in making films. So uh, I decided to um, uh, start applying to different schools and I got into USC's film program and um, just kind of saw it as a calling, like I had to do it. 
Um, and actually, Kaiser ended up being very supportive of it and uh, kind of allowed me to retain my job but work remotely and go to school. And I brought my wife down, and we and I went to school. And uh, I was in the program for about three years and um, kind of always wondering how public health and film were going to fit together. Um, I always kind of felt like I wasn't sure if I was a filmmaker or a public health professional and moonlighting as one or the other. Um, and, but what I did start realizing is that my public health experience began informing my filmmaking. And I started making films um, about things that had public health uh, implications. And so when I came across uh, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, um, I learned that they were providing grants to filmmakers that um, uh, were making films about uh, um, s uh, films that had scientific themes. And it just seemed like, oh, this is just a perfect fit. And I should say, the first time that I had heard the Jon Snow story, you know, in like Public Health 101 class, I always thought it was a very cinematic story. It always had a really natural arc to it. And a lot of wonderful characters with, you know, especially Jon Snow, this, you know, um, uh, diligent, uh, science-oriented, ented uh, kind of loner. And then you have Henry Whitehead, this gregarious uh, man of faith. Um, really interesting characters set in a very interesting time that we've already seen uh, lots of stories and films about, you know, with Dickens, London, and things. Um, so uh, it just seemed like a great fit, and I, I submitted a proposal to them, and they liked it, and uh, we made the film. And uh, now you're watching it. <laughs> I don't. Was there something? Um, I don't know if other. We should wait for questions or. So yeah, okay. So a little background on the filmmaking. So we shot the film in Los Angeles. Uh, we had, you know, it was clearly a, a, a tall order uh, to shoot 1850s London in Los Angeles on a very small budget. Um, it, we, we made it for $20,000. Uh, yeah. Well, that plus we had USC um, resources that we could use. So we used their sound stages and some of their editing suites and things, which normally you'd have to spend a lot of money on. Um, but yeah, we made it on an extremely low budget. Nobody got paid in this movie for anything. Maybe our, it's always the makeup person that gets paid, right? Because because they're like, you need makeup, but you can't really, I don't know. For some reason, it's always the makeup person. But uh, anyway, so uh, no one else got made. None of the actors. And, you know, L.A. is filled with actors that are looking to, you know, do a real, especially this, what was nice about this movie was that um, it's a period piece, so it was really appealing to a lot of creative people. Um, you know, actors want to finally get to use their British, act British accents. Uh, uh, costume designers want the opportunity to do, you know, period piece, production designers. So it was really appealing in terms of that um, to, to attract uh, crew and cast. And, um, and like, you know, it's L.A. There's no lack of people interested in getting into the business. And so we uh, auditioned for several days um, trying to find the right people for, you know, for a short film, it actually has a lot of cast. And we had to fill a lot of roles in very kind of specific kinds of roles. And um, so, yeah, so we really tried to take our time with casting it because we knew that that would be a really important element. And then as far as shooting, we shot for nine days. Um, it was a really just a whirlwind, crazy tour. The, the one, um, the one thing that uh, challenged us the most was how we were going to get our exterior shots, you know, the, the shots around the pump, where were we going to shoot that, how was that? Because just about every interior scene was shot uh, at USC, actually, in their various places. Um, and uh, so we thought that uh, what we realized that really the one place that is Europe in LA is Universal Studios, because they have a European street. So we spoke with uh, Universal Studios, we're, you know, we're students, we're, we're trying to make this movie, and they were very agreeable uh, to kind of give us a really low budget rate, but we'd have to kind of wait and see how the schedule filled out and stuff. 
Anyway, so as we got closer and closer to shooting, we actually ended up using Universal as kind of this way to attract people to the, to the movie. You know, we're going to be shooting at Universal, come work on this great film, and yada, yada, yada. And um, so we actually even built our whole shooting schedule around the day that we were going to shoot at Universal. And um, it was like maybe our fourth day into shooting, and we were already getting kind of tired and everything. Um, and, uh, of course, the day before we're supposed to shoot at Universal, I get a phone call from, I don't remember who, but it was that USC, there was an issue with the liability forms, and USC is not going to sign the forms. And I guess they had worked with Universal before, but since GE took it over or something, it just went on and on. And so I, I was, like, totally freaked out because I, you know, I felt like I, Told everybody we were shooting at Universal, and now I got to tell everyone we're not shooting. What are we going to do? And um, so I actually left set and kind of put uh, my first AD in charge, and I kind of charged up to the dean's office, like you know, you know, give him hell and whatever. But of course, I'm really nobody, and they didn't really care. So, uh, <laughs> so I just uh, went back to the set, all kind of down and like not sure what we're going to do, and. You know, my producer, I'll never forget this, came up to me and he said, look, man, he said, we are film students, you know, like, we're creative people. We don't need Universal, you know, let's do this thing, you know. And it felt so good because I said, okay, we'll do it, you know, and I, and I kind of let Universal go. And it was just like, it was such a great feeling to kind of let that, sometimes you hold on to things so tightly and you think it's like everything, but the moment you let go, it totally frees you up for new opportunities. And so we put out a massive email, like, we've got to shoot, we've got to find this place that looks like 1850s London, and we only got, like, four days to do it, and da 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 da, da. And, you know, we got emails from people, and, and people talked to people, and they said, and we checked out these different places, and finally we got led to, um, and you recognize it, to the set of Cagney and Lacey. Uh, and uh, they were, uh, it's called Lacey Street Productions, and they were so nice to us. They had no paperwork, which was great. Uh, they gave us a really flat cash fee, you know, and they had a huge prop room that we could use all their props for set design, and it just worked out really well. And it actually ended up, I think, being way better than Universal ever would have been. Um, so I guess, I don't know, it was just kind of a story that always comes up for me when I think about uh, filmmaking, that, you know, there's always a way to kind of make it happen. You think you're about to embark on the impossible, and somehow you find a way to make it happen, and it does. So. Thank you. So can I get any of you film guys to say a little bit about some of the artistic decisions that go into deciding how to make a film about public health or science? Isaac and I have talked a little bit over, over lunch about the importance of historical accuracy and scientific accuracy as compared to an artistic vision. I'd love to know what any of you think about that. Well, ironically, um you know, I bumble it in the story. I, I moved back here from Hollywood. I was producing Saved by the Bell for eight years. So this was a different story than that, a little. Um, um, you know, to me, this is the greatest story never told. I mean, when Jonas Oak was alive, he got movie offers from every studio. Marlon Brando wanted to play him. And he said, there'll be no movie made in my lifetime over this. But really, what, 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 why I think this, they're, they're very parallel stories in certain ways in the fact that you know, it's somebody going against the grain. Um, I, I realized this was a good story. My, I was making another movie, and my stepfather, who's 88, um, told me he had actually turned down a job with Jonas Salk when he was out of medical school at Pitt. I said, why'd you do that? He said, I didn't think his research was going anywhere. So, <laughs> good decision. But the amazing thing is I was at, at dinner with somebody who was a, um, who you saw, Sidney Busis, who was doing tracheotomies and iron lung patients. And he said he'd pull them out every day and he'd have to put a hole in their neck and then put them back in, and he did this 18 hours a day. And I said, oh my gosh, that's the scariest thing I ever heard. And the wife said, no, that wasn't the worst part. I said, that wasn't the worst part? She said, at the end of the day, he'd come home, and my young kids would run to hug them, and they could get polio and end up in an iron lung. And I went, oh my gosh. You know, and I'm going to turn to the horror guy in a second, but <laughs> this is a horror movie. You know, this is what everybody went through, is every summer they couldn't go out and play. No one knew what was happening. It, it's true terror, and, and the nice thing about polio is, of course, it has a happy ending to the point where I have a daughter who was six who's now 12, and, and she kept saying, tell me the story again, Daddy. I'm like, you want to hear the story of polio? But it's the story of the boogeyman comes, a bunch of people get together, figure it out, and because of their efforts, 
you can go to sleep not worrying about it. The hardest thing for public health is now that it's so, you know, my daughter and none of this new generation knew what polio was. And to be honest with you, I didn't know who Jon Snow was till thank goodness I came here. But, you know, the story seems very simple. <laughs> and it's hard to tell the story, I can tell you this, because um, there's a guy also from the Peace Corps from Lionsgate who went to Pitt, was coming back, and he saw our trailer that our students, we started it as a student project, and he said, why wouldn't Leonardo DiCaprio want to play Jonas Salk on one hand? And then on the other hand, it's a very, very hard story to tell because it's a story of absence. You know, the hardest thing is how do you see, how do you document what's not there? And that makes it a lot trickier than some things. Uh, um, and Adam does trauma, so I will let him talk about, I mean, when I, when I moved back to Pittsburgh, I didn't know anything about Night of the Living Dead. I was scared of scary movies that he teaches about. But I believe you, some people could think that's like a virus, that's like all these traumatic movies. So I'll let Adam take it from there. And careful of the water, by the way, Adam. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I guess I, I am the, the horror guy, the trauma guy, the scary guy. Uh, a lot of my research does deal with horror and the fantastic and the, and the traumatic. And uh, I, I am, am very happy to be here with a very different sort of audience than I usually speak to, uh, but I think you all have a lot of experience with, with horror yourselves because um, parts of, of public health, as, as we can see in these, in these two films, are very frightening. And, and there's a reason, I think, that one of the first things we see in Snow and in the trailer we saw for Shot felt round the world is a monster is established. You know, that first intertitle in Snow is about cholera and the destruction that it causes. There's something to be scared of. Uh, the first uh, moments of the, the, the trailer show us almost sort of um, uh, images reminiscent of uh, 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 an atomic blast where we have children and then they're, they're whited out by, by the uh, 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 the flash. So there's, there's, there's a way in which the story of a disease and its cure is, is not that uh, different from lots of stories that horror films tell. And, and, and I think there's, there's a lot of uh, room here, and, and I hope we have a chance to talk more about it, uh, uh, about the, the qualities that, that the sorts of films based on real people like, like Jon Snow and Jonas Salk can have in common with films like Night of the Living Dead, which as, as Pittsburghers you, you, you need to see if you haven't. <laughs> and, uh, and even going all the way back uh, to Nosferatu, the, the 1922 German film by, uh, by Murnau, um, that's the first and, and to my mind best version of the Dracula story is explicitly uh, a story set where vampirism is uh, a black plague. And the work that the vampire does is uh, indistinguishable from the work that the plague does. So in an age where vampires are, are again popular, I think this is a topic worth <laughs> talking, talking more about. And uh, it, doesn't look, it, it doesn't always look as pretty as Twilight. <laughs> Uh, Jeremy or Brittany, do either of you have any sort of introductory comments you want to make before we throw it out to the audience? Sure. Um, I, the thing that struck me about both, both movies, actually, is that um, both of these diseases have now been conquered, and they're, they're uh, certainly in the U.S. and in Western Europe and developed nations, they're not really a problem anymore. And that's one of the issues now as, as public health researchers and professionals is that people here generally aren't scared of infectious diseases so much anymore. I remember um, my head of department was a child in the, in the late 40s and early 50s, and he was saying when he was growing up, his parents were always terrified that this was the year he was going to end up walking with the brace, or this was the year he was going to end up in an iron lung. And people were viscerally terrified at the prospect of this happening to their children or to their, to their other loved ones. And now, because of the, the work of Snow and, and of the Zong Cholera, and because of the work of Salk and, and Sabin and Kaprowski on... Um, polio vaccines, those diseases are not a problem anymore, and people are forgetting what it's like to be scared of the disease itself. They're now worried about vaccine side effects and things, and one of the challenges of 
us as public health professionals is, is to remind people what life is like without good public health work and without good medical research work um, curing these diseases. And there are still diseases waiting to be cured, and in, in five years' time there will be other emerging infections that I couldn't even identify at the moment that will, be, that will become public health problems. So this, the, these are uh, you know, interesting historical um, dramas, but they could also be events that, that could happen again in the next few years. Thank you. Well, I was truly amazed by how much of the story you were able to get in in 20 minutes. I mean, that, that's really impressive. Uh, this is a, an interesting, complex story, as I'm sure you've all read about, because I hope you've all read the book. I even got the anesthesiology part in there just a bit. And, and that's where I got involved. And I'm fascinated by the issue, if you will, the backstory. Uh, what, what was it that led Snow to this? And it really wasn't the epidemiology that he did, that was the convincer. He had a very well-formed hypothesis going in there against what everybody else was saying. He basically was someone who was, I would today call an inhalation toxicologist. Uh, we know of him as the father of epidemiology, but if you go across the street from our School of Public Health and into uh, the Department of Anesthesiology, they won't know about his epidemiology. They'll tell you he's a father of anesthesiology because his research was really on understanding how chemicals caused effects on the lung. He jumped on this new field of anesthesia, which just occurred about four or five years before the epidemic that Isaac showed. Um, and uh, the, you know, when it happened, all these things went wrong. A lot of people died from the anesthesia being used inappropriately. People weren't sure how to use it. Uh, there was a lot of opposition. Uh, much anesthesia was used in childbirth, and of course a lot of people saying that women are supposed to suffer in childbirth, and therefore we should not use anesthesia. It's against God will. Um, the thing that made it happen, made it be accepted, anesthesia, was Queen Victoria having her eighth baby using anesthesia. And she chose, of course, the, her doctors chose the very best anesthesiologist they could get. That was John Snow. So John Snow developed a whole series of different things. And his understanding of respiratory dynamics, including years before having done studies of trying to drown guinea pigs and seeing how long it took to resuscitate them, because he, he was worried about you know, newborns bo being born seemingly dead. How, what can you learn about how to resuscitate them? He was so knowledgeable about inhalation he basically was able to discard the miasma theory as being just simply, it didn't make any sense. How could you inhale something? Nothing happened in the blood, really, except for dehydration effects. Why would the gastrointestinal tract be affected? So he had this hypothesis. He worked on it. And when this next epidemic came around, he wrote about it in the previous epidemic, he was able to use, if you will, the science of epidemiology to basically convince others. So it, the question is, how much science do we need to make the, the right decision? That's how I ended up writing a paper about it, and in a sense an argument for really understanding basic science, that there's a role for basic science, not just making an association, but, uh, but understanding what associations to look for and what are grounded in, in fact. Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, um, you know, it's every kind of budding filmmaker's dream to make their first feature, and uh, that's where I kind of feel like I'm at. I've made several short films, and um, I am really hoping that uh, more people find interest in this topic in this film because I, I think it's a much larger story than I've depicted. I feel like I've really only shown uh, kind of one one side of the story. Um, I, you know, it's a really it was a really challenging task to to write this script. 
Um, you know, you mentioned about squeezing it all in, you know, and it really was. It was like, what elements um, of this story are most important and who's going to watch it, you know? Um, I wanted to, you know, shed light on epidemiology and on this, this person, you know, um, but I had to be kind of really careful about which, um, which elements I thought were most important and which things I would take license to change artistically, you know. Um, anyhow, so I, uh, it was a challenge. And in making this short film, I realized that uh, there's really a much larger project here. Um, and I think a really interesting one because, as you can see, Whitehead wasn't even in the story, you know. And he's such a fascinating character, especially for film. Uh, and I think also that you have, uh, you know, you have this, this scientist and you have this, um, this, this priest who you really want to see interact with each other. And, and, and this part of the story, you know, before the, the handle gets removed, they don't even really know each other yet. So I kind of see this, for, this film as kind of the first act of the larger story where all the interesting stuff happens afterwards, where that's really where the maps start getting made. That's where uh, Whitehead and Snow first start getting to know each other and learning from each other um, and, um, and so forth. So in answer to your question, that's really the story that I want to tell, but it's also the story that I need a lot of money for. Uh, so that's what I really hope, is that someone with a lot of money will help me do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, <laughs> I, I should tell you that uh, it's amazing to me because these are stories of how the world changed. You know, hundreds of millions of people have been saved because of vaccines. And it is, um, I've actually taken on your guys' cause by accident. Um, when I was doing the, Salk, during the 50th anniversary, I was talking to the producer of something the Lord made that won an Emmy uh, about heart. Uh, um, and some of the early heart, heart transplants that went on. And we went over to try to see where's the movie here, and we met with Lionsgate. I mean, part of the problem is it's all about relationships, and you have to take the audience back to understand what the stakes were for taking a drink of water. And it's, it's, it, it takes a lot of skill to do that. It also it, it is very expensive to make a movie like this. The interesting thing, we got lucky. We started as a class project, and I'm pleased to announce um, last week we won Best Documentary at the San Luis Obispo Festival. And this week we just heard that we got picked up by the Smithsonian Channel, so our movie's going to play there um, in terms of a documentary. But what's interesting is what we got lucky on is that Bill Gates, um, in the last year I spent going around with the Gates Foundation and Rotary because they've spent a billion dollars uh, trying to uh, eradicate polio, uh, Rotary has, and then Gates has matched it by another half a bi uh, billion dollars. And he, uh, last year I was at a press conference with him and Diane Sawyer and Itzhak Perlman and all these people, and yet very few people still know polio is a problem. And his idea is if you can't get people to finish one disease, we can't go on to the next one. So, you know, I think your field does have a real PR problem, and hopefully it's people like him. I mean, it is the greatest as Bill Gates. I don't have to say it. We've got a cartoon of Bill Gates saying it, which is it's where he wants to put all his money because he thinks vaccines do the most to help the most people per dollar, per cent. I mean, I, I'd be curious what you think about that, but, you know. No, I mean, it's absolutely right. Vaccines are probably the most cost-effective form of treatment and, and disease prevention that we have in terms of number of lives saved for small amount of investment. You know, the entire eradication of smallpox um, cost, you know, a few hundred million dollars in today's money, and it, it saved hundreds of millions of lives already. <laughs> um, 
Well, let's see. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, it's it was a. Um, I, well, first of all, I should say that it was probably mostly me that put the most pressure on myself to try to find a factually accurate story that I could live with. You know, honestly, I I think um, especially outside of this ro like rooms like these, most people would never know. And, and that's something that film does all the time. You know, it's like, they won't notice it. Don't worry about it. No, and even if two people in the theater notice it, who cares? You know? So, um, th and that's really what's taught. I mean, that's what's taught in, in filmmaking school, you know? And so, um, at, you know, coming from uh, a public health background, I think personally I had my own kind of legions to the story and I wanted to be a responsible filmmaker when I made it, you know. Um, so, but that being said, really there were, there were, there was no way to tell the story in such a way that I wanted to tell the story that could be entirely historically accurate. So I had to kind of make choices about what I could live with and what I couldn't live with. So one thing I decided I could totally live with is uh, changing the order of things, you know, like, we didn't, Snow didn't make his maps until after the pump handle was removed. And he didn't really use his maps, per se, as a way to discover or, to, or convince. Uh, they were used later, really, to validate you know, his theories uh, using this example. You know, and he'd already been, obviously, doing research for a long time in the field. Um, so I had to decide, so I decided that I was okay with moving things temp because I really thought it was necessary for people to see the maps. Like how can I tell this story and people who never heard of snow not see his maps, you know? Um, so I was okay with that and um, outside of that, like I really just try, you know, I really try, like, I really looked at the books, I tried to gather facts, I tried, you know, there was a lot, there was so much to tell. There was his anesthesiology and how that informed his decision making. Uh, what characters, you know, I barely touched on William Farr, who was an integral part of the story. Uh, clearly, you know, Whitehead was written into the script, the original script. He was there, and it was great, but uh, he slowly just got kind of whittled down and whittled down and whittled down. And, and as much as I tried to hold on to him, we realized that he just added nothing to this story, to this version of the story, you know, because the truth is he came later, you know. And... Um, so I had, you know, it was decisions like that, and they were really hard to make, and I usually was able to make them, because if you notice, I did have a co-writer who knew nothing about Snow and nothing about this. I mean, he did his own research, but not coming into the project. He was really valuable for me, because I was able to kind of, like, bounce things off him and be like, you know, but, you know, what, you know Whitehead's not in this, or the map making came later, you know, how can we say it's now, whatever, and it's... Are you kidding me? You know, no one will even know, or no one will even care. Or, but who, you know, so, you know, and it also, you know, it depends on your audience. Like, who do you want to get something out of this movie? You know, and I got to tell you, the greatest thing is that I, I've shown this movie to lots of people who are way beyond the bounds of public health, and I always get people coming up to me after, going, "God, I never knew that story. Such an interesting story. Never heard of that guy." You know, and they don't remember the map being before or after or whatever, you know, they don't care, and, but maybe they'll go online and, and learn a little bit more about it, I don't know if that's the best source, but, uh, you know, but they will, you know, they, they'll be inspired to maybe learn a little bit more and, you know, find the flaws in my story, you know, which is fine with me, so. Okay. So, Carl, your, your film was a documentary, does that mean it's completely true to uh, uh, Julie Youngner, who's one of the great, uh, <coughs> players in this movie and in, in Pitt and in many things um, doesn't really tell a, there, he said you can't tell the real story for a variety of reasons not even the uh, there was a lot of conflict we couldn't get in we have um, about uh, 50 hours worth of material and, and to be honest with you we've heard many of the parts of the story um, you know the, uh, my mentor Joel Schumacher who I did Samuel's Fire with had a quote the truth is always moving um, it's a very um, you know you try to first of all you try to go back at, when I started actually there's a guy and I should know his name who's at the medical library who yelled at me and said the golden rule you got to do what, with what information they had then you can't project back 
and say, oh, they should have, why did they kill 18,000 monkeys? Or, you know, you've got to go and look at the standards of the day. Um, you know, we took so friggin' long to make our movie, six years, that we got to um, find so many different versions of the story. Uh, and interestingly, Smithsonian's going to re-edit it yet again. So, you know, it's all your point of view. And the biggest problem, again, I, you know, the reason we're working so hard, I did not really care about polio or making a movie. I've done that before. Um, I actually wanted to try to elicit some change. And the truth of the matter is we've really started a viral video contest called Take a Shot Changing the World. There's flyers in the back. We give $10,000 away to young people who make their own version of how would they impact the world. To me, um, I know you're the Jonas Salk chair, but when, when Jonas was passing, uh, before he died, a guy from Pittsburgh interviewed him, spent three days, and he said, he said a lot of things, but I remember two words, study success. And I think if you look at these, I'm sure that's what you guys do. Uh, and again, I should know more about what you do, and I want to know. But really, you got to give people the roadmap to replicate it. I mean, people pulled together. While we were making our movie, uh, people in Hollywood were starting to making an anti-vaccine movie, and we literally had to go and, and, and lobby against it um, because of all the aut autism thing. And we had to say, look what happens when we pull together. I mean, I think, and, and I'm curious too, I'd like to hear from the scientists a little, is it a coincidence that these guys are both going against the grain, against the medical orthodoxy, or is this something that is, you know, how medical history, you know, this is how achievement happens. I'm curious what you guys think. Or is that just the part we remember now, because that makes a good story? Yeah, right? well, it's definitely how movies happen. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> what do you think? I remember a, a story told me by the uh, professor of virology at NYU when I was a medical student who had taught both Salk and Sabin. And he basically said that at the time that the polio epidemics were going, and I remember as a kid my mother going around with a uh, fly swatted to kill every fly because people thought flies were then in, in terror. I mean, just it was so frightening a thing. Uh, but at that time, measles was worse, or at least as bad as polio. But measles was something everybody got. So that you, you know, the fact that 0.2% of the kids who got measles ended up as vegetables dying uh, was uh, something that was part of just background kind of things. Well, polio came out of the blue. It's the horror that you were talking about, Adam, that polio was, was, was different because it did, we didn't realize that, gee, just about everybody got uh, this virus, uh, but very few got the paralytic form. It just, wow, it just came out of nowhere. So that's such an important part of that story and such an important part of the scientific attention. From a scientist's point of view, what the virologist, what Dr. Barksdale was saying to us, though, was that, you know, it was because people were frightened that they put all that money into it and the real key things were the basic science approaches that allowed you to see the virus, grow the virus. And once you conquered polio, it was easy to conquer measles because it was the same advances, more or less, that were needed for measles. And so by letting the public, if you will, express their horror and, 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 and do it by putting votes and putting dollars into doing the science, you ended up getting both of these. Well, remember, there was no public money and it was marketed. I mean, yeah. Roosevelt's lawyer, Basil O'Connor, the March of Dimes, which was you know, obviously part of something. This is what's not happening today. Instead, autism, you know, you had so many conflicting stories. Nobody's gone ahead and said, let's end this. And frankly, I hate to say it to Pitt, there was no government money. There was no NIH. There was none of that. Everyone just decided. But it was very orchestrated and using media, which I think is something that, again, I think it's not only the School of Public Health here, but, you know, I think Bill Gates and everybody, I mean, I believe there's, and you guys can tell me, there seems to be more resources being put into global health. And with the internet, we're all so connected, but nobody's figured out exactly how to raise the visibility of this. Otherwise, Bill Gates wouldn't be giving us money for polio pens and things. But, but I don't know why. Why do you think it's so hard to get the story out? I mean, has well, I, again, I would point to, I just point about, about horror. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, so that's all I you know, There are attempts at, quote, getting the story out. For instance, uh, the, the movies. Uh, that are out now. Contagion uh, is supposed to be. I'm curious in your thoughts about are we going to have to do that uh, to be able to get the story out is to make the Contagion style, you know, Hollywood version? Right. Me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I guess I think, you know, what we can see just 
thinking about the two films we have on the table here, Snow and The Shot Felt Round the World, um, both films uh, based on, on, on real incidents and real people, but films that, that take very different approaches to that subject matter. And I think that fiction films, Hollywood films even, uh, have a role to play in this too. Um, they, they won't do what a documentary does. They won't do what a short film that doesn't need to answer to a big studio can do. Um, but I think they do have a role in, uh, in generating questions, in generating awareness, in generating interest. Um, uh, I, I guess I'm curious, I, if, you, if you saw Contagion, what, what were the things coming from your line of work that, that, that really sort of bothered you uh, about it? Well, I, uh, I, do, I was the reviewer for the Post-Gazette. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, in my comments, uh, when they interviewed me after the film, I yeah. said it was exactly the kind of movie that I would make. Uh, accurate and boring. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you felt the movie was too, too, too scientific. And, and in fact, what they did in the Post-Gazette was they said, Dr. Bertie in the School of Public Health said it was exactly the kind of movie he would make accurate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that's usually the way I'm quoted, too. Is there yeah. a better way? Because they had, for a while, this was super hot. Disease was really hot in Hollywood. Before this, with Outbreak and what was the other one? Um, there were two racing to get it, and they thought the Dustin Hoffman movie, they're like, why was that one better than Contagion? A hot zone, yeah. Right, right. So, why, what, what do you think makes a good one out? I mean, I think, I think the best, uh, uh, you know, disease <laughs> movies are, are, are not films like uh, Contagion or even um, uh, The Andromeda Strain, which is, which is, which is one of my favorites, which, which, which you know, is, is about a, a disease. But, but I, I think films uh, that, that have a more kind of visceral impact are, are the films that are much more fantastic and metaphorical. I mean, things like, uh, you know, 28 Days Later. I don't know if, if people know that film, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a film about a, uh, a plague that, that, that has no real um, uh, credibility. It's, it's a fantastic story, it's a fantastic narrative, but it, it infects people in an incredibly quickly and uh, uh, frightening way, this, this sort of rage virus, it's called, and, and these people become uh, maniacal uh, uh, murderers, like at, at the drop of a hat. I am, I am legend kind of thing, Will Smith. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. That, 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 that's, that's another movie I would, I would talk about in this, in this way. So, I mean, I, I, think, I think cinema has a vocabulary for scaring us, for showing us things that we might not want to see otherwise, things if that we saw, oh, here's a newspaper article or a, or a book or a textbook about uh, polio or cholera, we'd say, no, I have enough depressing things in my life. I, I, I don't need to deal with this. But in the, in the format of a, uh, of a story that offers um, imaginative and fantastic possibilities, we might be actually willing to engage some of those things in, in a way that we might not be willing to otherwise. I mean, my, my, my first book uh, was all about how uh, horror films of the, uh, of the 60s and 70s, like Night of the Living Dead, actually had more truth to tell us about the turbulent uh, social and political problems of that time than the films that were explicitly about those issues. And it's because the films, these horror films, were willing to get us to feel things and, and, and think things in ways that the conventional films were just not willing to do.
But the challenge for me was finding these kind of movies, like Snow and documentaries that weren't quite as well known, and we had no access to them. How do you overcome that, and how do you get these movies to the students well, in a public classroom I, so that they can watch them? So I have to tell this, so periodically my wife moves back to Los Angeles and I have to commute, so because of <laughs> Pittsburgh versus LA, it's a long story. So my daughter, when we were doing this, my daughter was in fourth grade and we were in like year four of the polio movie or three or whatever. And she had a really mean teacher who made us show the one hour documentary that was still a rough cut of polio. And I said to her, you can't do this, it's got kids in iron lungs and kids die and shots and things. and. So, but she was mean, and she said, you must all go to the library, and we showed the movie, and she said before, how many of you want to be scientists? And one kid late, raised, and said, eh, maybe, <laughs> nothing. I said, really, you're going to do this? But she was mean, and so she showed them the movie. Well, particularly the boys in the audience, you know, they loved it because it had iron lungs, and kids died, and other kids were things. <laughs> Everything that I thought was horrible, and by the way, it is, the guy who cut our movie is a Hollywood editor. I mean, we started with Pittsburgh, but the truth is, whether it's a documentary or his, you know, you need a good film that's engaging. You know, like, I think your review is quite accurate. Better to show them Night of the Living Dead and talk about infectious disease, than, by the way, show something else to balance it out. That's, and, and to me, the reason that we're doing this Take a Shot Changing, around, uh, take a shot around changing the World is, any 10-year-old or 15-year-old kid can make a movie now. So all we said last year is, look, the Gates Foundation had a problem, but nobody cares about polio eradication. We show this movie and say, you connect it. You watch a movie and you make a movie, and the teachers are very intimidated. They go, oh, we don't know how to make movies. I'm like, don't. You tell them about infectious disease, let them make the movie, okay? And we'll give them money. And that seems to be a good formula. But I really hope in the digital age now, you know, let's face it, in three years, kids are going to be, you know, they'll, watch a, they'll read a book, they'll watch a movie, they'll make a movie. That's how they'll learn. And to be honest with you, these kids accidentally did more research on polio. Uh, Julie Youngner would not do a research, uh, a reshoot for us that we wanted, but one of the kids who lived next to him said, hey, can I talk to you? <laughs> I'm like, do you know who you're talking to? But, you know. So I'm really a big believer that, ironically, we called it a viral video contest with a little pun. But, you know, you guys should take this and run with it. You're the viral people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I have an idea for the next semester student projects coming up. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, do you think films, um, I guess, along the line of public health, uh, can be used to educate a lot of developing countries so they understand what the role of public health is, especially in terms of battling a lot of the infectious diseases that they are dealing with? Sounds like a question for the Peace Corps guy. Uh, <laughs> um, I think it's a great idea because, um, you know, I, in my experience in Cameroon, uh, you know, whenever there was a TV somewhere, it was like certainly there was a crowd of people around it. Really easy way to get people's attention. Uh, I guess the only issue that it brings up for me kind of is uh, the implementation of technology and stuff like that is, is um, can be challenging and difficult just with things like basic needs like electricity and things. But the truth is, I mean, a lot of what we did with, um, with uh, education and stuff was, we, you know, we often be found putting on little plays, you know, and uh, it was really about like, you know, trying to find entertaining ways to uh, get the message across. Um, so, you know, it's really the same thing, uh, but yeah, certainly if you're able to kind of more mass produce it and you have a more invasive way to get the education across, I think it's great. Uh, one thing that might change all that is cell phones because my understanding, I mean, I haven't been to Cameroon in a while, but that the biggest difference since I was there is cell phones and that people out in the most rural areas can now communicate and if that means they can have cell phones, you know, maybe soon they're also going to be watching stuff on their cell phones, which, you know, that to me seems like a really great way to um, reach people uh, out there. So that would be my initial thought. I do want to add something that I bumbled into. About three months ago, somebody asked me, as I didn't know why we were going to be on this panel, and I kind of, but to be, to do a, 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 um, something on media between kids and 
in Pittsburgh and Avonworth High School and kids in Pakistan. And it turns out they all watch Glee in Pakistan, which I had no idea. <laughs> a show called Thundercats, which I was before my time or after, you know, so these kids. So the interesting thing is these kids were talking about media and I accidentally, because I'm a salesman for getting everyone to go to take a shot, contest.org. So I said, hey, you know, we're doing this contest about polio, you guys should make a video. And then, like I'm an idiot, they said, oh, we know all about that. And I was with a high school auditorium of high school kids, and I went, oh yeah, there's four, three countries, there are four countries where polio is endemic, Afghanistan, Nigeria, um, India until a year ago, oh, it's now been polio free for a year, and then Pakistan. So for once I just shut up and let the kids there talk to the kids in Pittsburgh, and I went, oh my gosh. And in fact, on April 12th, we now con Pitt into doing something, so we're gonna do, get a bunch of kids from around the world all talking about global health because they'd rather do that than read a book. Um, and where this is gonna go, I'm not quite sure, but it is, uh, you know, that was a big part about the polio thing. They had trouble communicating the information when people thought it was a government plot. And so it's a big part of the, uh, you know, could be a big part of the solution. We should wrap this up. Um, there is a reception outside that I invite you all to join us for, but first, we have a one book, one community tradition now, I guess after three years, which is to collect everyone, especially all the students, to come take a photo with our guests. Uh, let's thank our, all of our panelists and then everybody come get in the picture. Thank you.